Children were playing basketball in long vests, skipping on the hot tarmac of a leafy cul-de-sac. There were white-painted houses and trees, and zephyrs hanging over the driveways. Chipping away at the moments that were adding up to a dull day, the twin girls on Redland Avenue could have been Britain's last Victorians. They stood outside their colonial home as though they had lived there for all of its life. Four ambivalent faces, four hands waving as we passed by. Daughters of a deeply royalistic man, convinced he was doing the king's work. Some of the front gardens looked like zoos. There were goats and pigs and dogs, cats and mandarin ducks, black and white swans, geese and an ornamental fish pond filled with giant koi carp. Turtles wallowed in a powder blue pool and all around us orange and blue coconut crabs scuttled across the pristine white sand. All very peaceful, I thought. The corner lot was a shop with a cola machine, but it was no Coke commercial. An old pump offered liquid metal with extra stamps and piles of mismatched car parts, all from under a corrugated plastic roof. In a wonder-cluttered porch, a hungry-looking junk dog with a short, thick coat and a homemade collar turned to look at us and then quietly returned to gnawing on a piece of dirty marrow bone. The place was smaller than I expected, but by then I was coming to realise that nothing was quite like I expected it to be. On the other side of the street, the buildings were distinctly Mormon, with one pointed blue spire and a big clock that displayed 15 hours in numerals I didn't recognise. Long shadows fell across the lawn of the cemetery and I found myself suddenly wondering if I was looking at a genuine cathedral or something from a film set. The town had its own quaint little fire station and post office with everything having been built on a small town scale, except for the buildings along the road ahead that were as pyramidal as Everest itself. Some were so lavishly crafted, they reminded me of the empirical styles of the ancient civilizations. The bank looked like a Wells Fargo bank from a Wild West movie, which would have been all well and good if it were on a movie set. When I looked through the window at the map on the wall, none of the countries were in the right places. Through the back window, I could see a horse pulling a rusty plough through waves of soil. In all the useful ways, the place seemed to be standing still or going backwards. Large knots of resistance began springing up in my mind. Could all of the past, starting from that moment, have been abolished? With every map rewritten, every political block repainted, every statue, street and building renamed? Was the only other human sharing any of my memories Bruce and the only evidence a cylinder of jewels that I daren't show to anybody? So the place became, with each and every footstep and with every fact, great or small, more and more bizarre until everything began to fade into a pale reflection of everything I used to know. A place where finally, even the date and the year were uncertain. We first saw her at the crossroads. She was straight out of a cool hallucination, flying high with the warmth of the red neon sky behind her. Like a fresh breeze, she streamed through the traffic, capturing hearts, blowing minds, defying all rules and limits and the tools of her defiance. Custom wheels worn on her feet, size six Bugattis, hand-built and well-oiled. The fact that she had created them from stolen and bartered parts went some way to explain why she'd been initiated into the gang known as the Angles of Science.
A zoo on wheels with traffic-stopping hair dyed red and green, wearing hot pants, the holy sight of which causing people to turn in their sleep for days afterwards. With no care for old ladies or the nuts that fell out of blind alleyways, Roller Girl took a chance, held the corner tight and let a tall palm glance her bikinied hip. She pulled up outside the shop and in words way above the ground spoke to some part-time boyfriend. But her happiness wasn't about romance. The commotion had nothing to do with the rapturous start to a new love affair. The short kiss she placed on his cheek belied an instinct for self-preservation. With her arms clasped firmly round him, she gently pushed him away with her words. He probably wasn't comfortable about smoking flowers with her. In a fit of pique, she lashed out with a karate chop and one no-limit punch that resulted in a boyish groan. He soon realised his cause was lost, and walked away. With blinking deep blue eyes, pouting red lips that hinted at a smile, and the slender turned up nose that snubbed the air around his face, she cared little for intimacy and heaven knows her real life affairs were never about the money. She was content enough with her present income. A salary of five grand a week and a hotel suite to herself a steady job with lots of regular clients at Cornicos Arcade, an underground playground two miles west. Of course, she was a slave to duties between the hours of 12 and 12 and had to pay the board like all the other girls. During her usual working day, it was a different kind of smell that filled her mind. So on the particularly hot days, she would skate home slowly past the pharmacy to take in the warm aroma of flora that blew out through the extractor fans. In the blink of an eye, she was inside and bathed in their scent. She rolled slowly towards the counter, looking around, taking it all in. As four dayglow wheels rolled around the shop, I watched a Miss World poised for the chase, with legs so wide apart they turned her in circles, whipping the chronics into a sore frenzy. In spite of her passion for top-shelf goods, she looked wonderfully healthy. I'm sure the skating helped. Her breasts and arms were faultless, but a connoisseur would have disapproved of her behind. The muscles were so hardened with all the rolling around, It had lost the puppy fat and resembled the ass of a Russian gymnast. As Luke stared at her through his thick glasses, the lenses slowly moved all over her. When she bent over forwards to adjust a wheel, she winked at him longingly. Luke's fascinated lenses blinked and he swallowed. He looked slightly faint with reaction and then a flush came to his cheeks. He stammered in a weak voice. We we have new, new flowers, new flowers today. It was just the kind of news she'd been waiting for. As he turned the blossom, she seemed filled with a new innocence, following the whirl of petals and buds as they circled around the stem. So excited to see the colours that ordered the whole of her life. She hustled right up close to Luke. His eyes gleamed through his glasses. First of the season, he said proudly. She stiffened up and so like a feline waiting for cream. It might well have been chocolates and champagne. I'm really grateful, she purred, stroking the back of his hand with a finger as he weighed off the petals. With one arm crooked on her hip and the other pointing at the flowers, she struck a pose and then twirled on her toes like a music box mannequin. We girls really need a man like you to help us. These these are from the new Glendora. They're the very best, I can assure you, he said, eyeing her all over without looking. 
It was a dreadful dependency that she'd done so well to hide. But soon the stifling heat of the afternoon brought a sweat out on her chest and was awakening something else in Luke. The temptress was dangerous within her. She could control it, play tricks with it, and like a wild animal she could sense desire in a man and had picked up on something in Luke's eyes. She knew the essential parts of his nature and quickly set the game in motion. The frigid little ceremony of playing with the corners of a lace hanky that soon developed into an arching of her back, a rising of her breasts and a sublime display of autoerotic self-touching. All elements of a play whispered in the words of one selling something illicit. With a pulse of concentration beating in his temples and his eyes lost in a daydream, Luke soon found some peace of mind, scooping loose petals into her waiting fanny bag. A smile wound across her face and she picked up a seed pod and, as customary in flower circles, dripped a little blue fruit juice into her mouth before pinching the pod open across her tongue. Captivated by the pearls of wisdom, her eyes twitched with delight. The stepping stones of the conversation were built around their colour and elegance and soon they were chatting in their own tongue. She confided in Mary, told her everything, explained that the adult work was giving her the leisure to sleep late, spend plenty of time on her hair, and to free boot around the studios whenever she felt like getting back on the movie starlet merry-go-round, spinning plates as a waitress on a Saturday and whirling around the shiny poles at Cornico's porno arcade. She would go home to her parents once a month for Sunday lunch and leave early, having slipped a few notes from her daddy's wallet. Get back to the road, pick up a couple of guys with the promise of a genuine girlfriend experience and then give them the full runaround. She had a few income streams open, numerous offers that had to be carefully considered. Decisions, decisions. Would she hit them hard for a bundle of fast cash? Or take them for a slow walk around the park, ease them into her gravy boat, set up a direct payment plan and have them dishing out in perpetuity? She sucked and swallowed on the seed pods one after the other until something turned up brighter in her eyes. Charged with a kind of happy melancholy, her voice floated upward on the warm floral air. After a few moments, she seemed perfectly content with everything. All the self-interest had disappeared. She leaned towards a mirror and began pointing in disbelief. As soon as she saw how she was dressed, she came over all uneasy and wanted to hurry back home and change her clothes. She pulled down her sleeves and pulled up her tube socks in a way that seemed to invite, not desire, but respect. She turned back to Mary and began talking about parenthood and that she could become fond of children in an old-fashioned way. The long, windy walks and the Sunday lunches would help. She was so enthused by the idea, it sprouted the most luxurious weeds of speculation around the shop. On the radio, reports were emerging of a rampaging deceased peasant called Fogo Wise. At first, I'd pegged him as a hopeless paranoid until I saw him close up, his dead brain calculating prices and available cash. After being pronounced dead after a road traffic accident, it turned out that he'd been placed in a body bag and put into storage at the King's Medical Centre. When the nurses had come to prepare his body for the funeral a few days later, 
They found his nose broken and his head covered in cuts and bruises, allegedly suffered as he tried to escape from the freezer. Apparently, he damaged his head as he writhed and wriggled upside down in a desperate attempt to escape his icy tomb. Once he was certified dead, he was rightly buried. But after finally escaping the plot, he'd supposedly strangled six hitchhikers before appearing back at his house to demand clean trousers from his wife. Caving into demands from her neighbours, the King's Imperial Provisions Unit finally allowed them to exhume the body. Well, obviously, it was gone. And now we were feeling his chilly presence as he shuffled around next to us in the pharmacy. Through great violet lips, half open in stupor, he sucked on a cigarette. As he shuffled, staring at everyone, just long enough to make them feel uncomfortable. I saw the tattoos through the Ziploc bags on his feet. As the crowd shrank back against the wall to let him pass, I got a clear look at him all right. Tall, gaunt and shrouded by the black winter bonnet of a ruthless hood, pulled down tight over his eyes and the hole where his nose used to be. A stiff, draped from head to foot in catalogue shop clothes. It was probably too much nylon that had amplified the toddle, that of a stiffened corpse cracking the last few air bubbles from their joints. It was strange because his remains, except for the nose which was somewhat fallen away, were completely fresh. I could tell because when he opened up to swallow down a lozenge, I saw some new blood in his mouth. On closer scrutiny, I noticed that his newly grown nails shone as he ran them through his matted brown hair. New slimy skin dripped through his ripped shirt. The stench rose in a vapour from his decaying head. He nodded a wry smile at those he passed, pausing now and then to leave a mad statement hanging in the air. He liked to keep his victims focused and maintain menace until he laughed nervously and turned away. The return of the son of nothing, with a look in his eyes that said, Death is my friend. Behind him in the queue was another upcycled person. Having left the planet a mean and crazy bank robber, he'd been reintroduced through one of the king's programmes. With his black eyes hidden by the hat of a night shift worker, he shuffled around the shop in a sullen daydream. It was easy to spot how they'd brought him back to life, probably after several attempts. The reanimation they were doing was usually a peaceful affair. New techniques had been developed that didn't usually leave any holes. In fact, there was no cutting at all. They went in through the ears. But this guy was different. On the back of his head was a bold patch, a blue permanent bruise, and two small button plugs stitched above each ear. You could tell by the look in those faraway eyes how they'd burned him at the factory. Eyes all coked up, as grey and deserted as haunted houses. The flabby patches under his eyes were round and brown and bulged like whopping marbles. Through a thick muddle of creases, he gazed with a fixed grimace. Death had enhanced the condition that caused his digestive system to brew its own alcohol. And in his paralytic state, he walked around the shop sideways in a disordered gait. In spite of him insisting that he didn't touch a drop, Mary tested him with a breathalyzer and found that his alcohol level was 0.40%. She gave him a floral lozenge for colonic irrigation. He seemed quite happy with that, sucking and chomping his way around the shop, 
coughing and spluttering with a yellow translucent sack of entrails spilling out from his bloated belly. As he pointed and shouted out at the colourful jars, his words mixed with yellow smoke. A few drops of the real hard stuff now. Luke leaned over towards me. His steady gaze masked a weariness made manifest by the loaded pistol he wore on his hip. I sometimes think it would be kinder to do away with all of these incurables. It's just that we don't know of a solution. Sometimes what's good for the living has a strange effect on this bunch. We had a mess last week. What was that? I asked. Some wild addict ran the security shutters after hours and attempted protest at the cost of licensed flowers. People need to understand you come in a licensed place, you get the best quality, but you pay the price or I'll shoot you. End of story. We both noticed the moth party developing on a buttercup flower or the promiscuous antenna of insects going together and kissing, and butterflies laying eggs on the nettles. He drew the blind, and since he didn't have much else to do, sat back under the colander of fresh rainwater that he would only break away from to swat the yellow and black insects that buzzed around his neatly trimmed bushes. In exquisitely carved chairs, we drank jasmine tea, me gently sipping and Bruce slurping from the saucer, his hand in the middle of a fruit salad. Both of us lost in the ambiance created by the flowers all around, every colour of the spectrum bending towards us in a greeting, while fellow customers morphed back and forward from circus animals to city types, from passive shoppers conversing in subdued tones to laughing hyenas. As they came and went, like a dog would with a rat, Luke fretted details at enormous length, and faced with the correct issue could work himself up into a state of nervous alarm. Without warning, he changed his glasses, and his pose became indicative of a man who was deep in thought, a man with a good head for facts, figures, details, and bugs. His beady eyes had spotted something. Oh my goodness, he said in a state of panic. He pulled a cord, a whistle blew around the shop. Oh my goodness, he said again and again. Green fly, green fly. Shaking his head, he went flapping around his desk in a terrible panic. Eventually, he dispatched the tiny green ticks with raking drafts of white powder blown through a bicycle pump. Once the powder had cleared, he leaned over and a big white pair of dusty eyebrows came towards us. With lips spitted in white residue, he floated on about his new lamps. I am dazed. I am dazzled with so much light. And when the mist rolls in, oh boy. With a brain for speciality and anything curious, he brooded over the flowers, talked to them and sighed with every line. Such infinite sweetness. (sighs) With petals so full of love, so full of work actually. Flowers, my only friendships. He seemed to understand horticulture for what it really was. Each day he learned new ways to express his love, scrutinising a flower with one lens while tuning into a TV gardening show with the other. He plucked a flower and handed it to me. Another one of my creations fashioned by my own hand to show men and women that there is a heaven that you can enter. It's right here in the shop, a shop full of love and sensations and a place where the lights were on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Go on, man, sniff it, he said, 
holding out a glass tube in my direction. I raised the glass to my nose, breathed deeply. Soon my head was heavy with the vapour of a smoking cocktail and everything in the shop took on the hue of neon reality.